Um, and it's my sort of uh, my privilege, really, to, to welcome you to, to this dialogue. Uh, if you're not familiar with Cornerstone Institute, um, we're uh, next year 50 years old, uh, an institution that started as a Bible college on the Cape Flats um, in 1970, and then grew and grew over time into the institution that we are today. And we offer programs in psychology and theology and business studies and education and sociology and community development and, and so forth. So we're a humanities institution, essentially. So, um, but our focus is, is quite clearly and strongly on social justice. So we're not a generic, if you will, or a typical type of broad spectrum institution. We go across disciplines with a focus on social justice, full stop. Um, and that's basically the heart of Cornerstone. So, but I'd invite you to sort of get to know more about Cornerstone. You know, there's some books here around our, our, our journey over 50, of, of 50 years and, and, of course, the website and so forth. And we have colleagues here. There's Noel, just Noel, just wave. Noel Daniels is our CEO. Um, and, um, and then you will find faculty here and, and some students as well. So if you ask around, you can get to the heart of who we are. But you're really most welcome. Part of what we think we should do as an institution in our society is to raise critical conversations. And uh, we know that's not a novel idea. Um, all of us attempt, and all of you most likely in different ways, attempt to do that. Um, but this is what we do. Uh, on a monthly basis, we attempt to bring um, you know, forums together, invite pu the public, and have brilliant speakers who work in particular areas of research and, and practice that speak to particular issues and see what we can open up in the discussion. Um, and then what we also do is, and you would find the partners here with us from the media, um, apart from District 6 and the Center for African Studies at UCT, is we try and extend the discussions from the forums in, in, in different ways uh, in media. So Bush Radio is, is, is with us here, um, you know, almost want to say, our radio, <laughs> uh, among others, but okay, our radio, um, um, and who's sort of uh, broadcasting some of this and we'll sort of uh, also play a clip a little bit later um, as part of that. And the Cape Argus, um, of course, is a major partner of ours. You would find in the, in the sort of recent editions there had been um, some of our previous uh, dialogues, uh, sort of reworked inputs by our speakers had been published as op-eds and so, and, and we really want to thank them. It's a big thing for us to be able to extend the conversation. Um, I left it out, but we're a non-profit institution, you know, full stop. <laughs> so we don't, our interest is really what happens in our society and how we can take it further. Now, one of the key things um, uh, that we push for is to how to extend our critical dialogue and input on an international, uh, on an international level, if you will, um, to scale the conversation and to connect with partners across the globe that actually you know, have this, a similar type of focus. Now, one of those partners, um, which we really value greatly, is, um, is the uh, Community Solution Group of Colleges in the United States. And if I have it right, they're joining us online, right? We're streaming and so forth. That I think Hot Coffee is doing for us. Where's Hot Coffee? Can someone just wave from Hot Coffee? Oh, yeah, thank you very much. It's brilliant. So um, welcome to everyone who's not here, but also here. <laughs> so, um, um, so really, you're welcome. Tonight's uh, conversation is uh, a major one for our society and also in the US as well. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to, to Fatima just now, who will we'll facilitate the conversation. Um, uh, but just to say, you know, um, this stays with us. And what seems interesting in how we raise the debate tonight is that we're asking how the trauma affects, if you will, on the binary, black and white, which I do think is a challenging conversation to have uh, in our context, especially in, in the broader conversation of decolonization. And so there's a number of um, uh, traumatic nuances, if you will, and, and highly emotive, um, and how to sort of, you know, talk with it and through it and, 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 and walk and, and struggle. So, um, yeah, thank you for being here. I also want to thank our speakers. I'll not do the introductions, but um, you are really most welcome and thank you for participating. So the invitation to you um, is to actually say what you think. You know, I almost want to say, say it raw. <laughs> we have enough psychologists here among us to hold us if we can't, you know. <laughs> I'm sure there's some, uh, some, uh, some faith leaders here as well, uh, 
and also just good people who will hold us. So, um, so please feel free to participate. I think it would be great. Fatima would arrange it, but um, you know, maybe not interrupt the speakers. Uh, you know, at, at at campus we we encourage it that our students would interrupt and say, "I disagree." Why are you saying that? But maybe that uh, no, you know. But you know, Fatima will decide. <laughs> so Fatima Swatch, you would be familiar with uh, with uh, one of our leading activists. So um, Fatima, you are you know, if I could ask you to. Thank you so much, Rudy, for um, that introduction. And thank you for everybody for coming out. We know it is Thursday. It's been a long week, and it's 5 o'clock. And <laughs> some of you might have wanted to go home, but find this um, your way here because you feel that this is an important conversation. And it's an important conversation because we all live in this world. And we live in this world without having had a choice by which color we were going to be born into which country we were going to be born into, uh, which class we were going to be born into, and which gender we were going to be born into. And so, so somehow, in our lived experience, there are certain things we, we have no choice about. But because we are in that situation, we need to find a way to navigate life in a way so that we can all reach the best of who we can possibly be, the biggest versions of ourselves. And uh, one of the challenges that we have is that we don't always expect that because of our color, that this will be a, a source of trauma. If you get born, and I'm sure if you're young, you think your parents are going to die, your boyfriend's going to drop you, your girlfriend is going to, your wife is going to divorce you, whatever, it's natural. Um, emotional sufferings, up and downs of life. But then we have an added one, the burden of our cultural backgrounds, the burden of our so-called race. And so we want to talk about that in a way which is affirming to us as people living on this earth in a way of our being a common human family but taking into consideration the roles that uh, patriarchy plays in terms of how we live and the impact of that, that class plays, that our identities around our ge ge geographical space, the economic systems that we find ourselves in and the impact that has on the psychosocial well-being of human beings, right? Um, we're going to ask, we have two very esteemed speakers um, with us, sorry for that. And the one person, of course, is very well known, which I'm first going to introduce, is Valdi. Um, well, at least she's well known to people in Cape Town. She's been an activist, and I suppose I've known her for many years, back in WEC days, when she was a teacher and she was organizing teachers, and that is what we do, we did in the past. Um, and Valdi is presently the director of the Trauma Center in, um, in Salt River. Salt River, right? Woodstock. Woodstock, okay. Yeah, she's the, she's the director of the Trauma Center for Survivors of Violence and Torture. Um, she was also a, a curriculum advisor for history um, for many years, and she taught where, that's when I um, got to know Valdi, on the streets of, of Cape Town. Um, she contributed to the development of learning materials um, in history. I'm not going to mention all of those. And then I think her passion really is you know, once a teacher, always a teacher. <laughs> uh, passion really is adult education, psychology, mediation, and uh, materials development and building capacity of people, teaching, learning, and developing human beings. And of course, that leads you to the point of when that becomes barriers in people being able to learn, it brings, I think, you to the point where you want to say, what is it that is preventing people to be able to learn, to grow, and to blossom? And that's where she is now. She is a, um, a doctoral candidate at the University of the Western Cape, um, focusing a dissertation on post-colonial feminism and violence as a barrier or enabler of women 
achieving their learning goals in the Western Cape. So, Valdi, if you're okay, I'm going to leave that there. Um, she would, she's going to talk a bit about her work that she is doing also in Manenberg and the present violence that we are um, experiencing. So, welcome, Valdi, uh, daughter of uh, Cape Town and um, the Cape Flats. And then we have an esteemed uh, colleague coming from the US, uh, Professor Lee, Professor Cortland Lee. And I will try not to butcher some of the names that is in this um, bio. Um, bio. So uh, Professor Lee is um, a counselor education program at the Washington DC campus of the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. He is an author, editor, and co-editor of seven books on multicultural counseling and three books on counseling and social justice. He's also the author of three books on counseling African-American males. In addition, he has published numerous book chapters and articles on counseling across different cultures. And then he's a, a whole lot of other things. So I'm going to skip some of it. But he is also the past president of the, because I asked him to, to tell me how to pronounce this, of the Chi Sigma Iota. International Counseling Honor Society is a chartered member of this um, society and is a former editor of the Journal of Multicultural Counseling and Development and currently serves on the Council of Consulting Elders for that journal. Um, and he has held the faculty positions at, as a counselor educator at the University of North Canada, Carolina at Chapel Hill and the University of Virginia. University of Maryland at College Park and the University of Malta. He serves as an international counseling and educational consultant. And I think what our two sp speakers have in common, our contributors, is the fact that I think they both have a love for education and they have a love, uh, I think, and a passion for working with people and helping them through um, the challenges that they might fight, uh, find because of the situation they, they live in. So we're going to have two almost separate sessions, right? And we're going to encourage all of you to participate, not at the same time, and not to interrupt each other. Because we believe in respect and human dignity. So the first talking point we want to, to, to go on is just personal reflections personal uh, from both uh, uh, contributors on racism in their countries and just how racist ideology has developed in that country. So personal reflections on racism and racism ideolog um, ideology, how it developed in South Africa and how it developed in the US. And for you also, as they are talking, to think about what they are saying, and then we're going to pause. They're each going to talk for about five minutes. We're going to pause and then open up the discussion, and then later we will look at the psychosocial impacts of it, as well as models and what people can do for intervention around these issues. Does that sound okay with you? Okay. So I'm going to hand over for this first session. I'm going to give our guests, um, our guests that travelled over many waters and who is a bit jet lagged, maybe still, the first opportunity. And then the second opportunity round, we will give Valdi the opportunity to speak first. So over to um, Professor Lee. Thank you very much and good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to say what a privilege and an honor it is for me to be here as part of this dialogue this evening. Um, as you heard, I'm a professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, the Washington, D.C. campus, which is part of the uh, Community um, Strategies Group, TCS, which is beginning this partnership with Cornerstone Institute. And um, I'm really excited about that. I know very soon um, that the two institutions are going to sign a memorandum of agreement to really do great things. So I'm really very happy to contribute a very, very small part of that burgeoning partnership. Um, the other thing I'm going to do, and I'm going to embarrass them terribly, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, the reason I am here in South Africa um, is I'm leading a group of students on a study abroad experience, 
and um, they're a group of master students who are studying clinical mental health, and we are here for 10 days um, as part of a course looking at racism. So they're all sitting right here, so if you all just stand up so everybody can see you. Now, I owe them big time because I've embarrassed them so much. <laughs> um, personal reflections on racism. Um, I'm going to start um, by reflecting on uh, November the 4th, 2008, um, which is a day, and particularly a night, I will never forget. Particularly at 11 p.m. on November the 4th, 2008, my life and the life of most Americans changed in ways that we could never imagine. In particular, if you were black. Because at 11 p.m. on November the 4th, 2008, all of our television networks proclaimed that Barack Hussein Obama had been elected President of the United States. In my lifetime, I never thought that I would see a black man elected president of the United States. Now, I'm old enough to remember when man walked on the moon for the first time. I know I look like I'm five years old, but I do remember <laughs> that. And I thought that was the greatest thing I would ever see in my lifetime. But on November the 4th, 2008, Barack Obama was elected as the first African-American president of the United States. There was so much elation, so much joy, not only among black people, but among all Americans, that suddenly we had turned a significant corner in the struggle that we had had for generations for equal rights among all people. And we really thought, in a very, very naive sense, that we had entered a post-racial era, that all of our issues around race and racism were suddenly gone because this black man had been elected president of the United States. What we didn't know is that that night, there was also an awakening of a whole new strain of racism that was ugly and virulent. It was a reaction to a black man being elected president of the United States. So I fast forward now to November the 8th, 2016. On November the 8th, 2016, Donald J. Trump was elected president of the United States, much to our surprise. And we knew then, particularly if we were black, but all Americans knew at that time, that our myth of a post-racial society was dead. And the virulent racism that was creeping up during the eight years that Barack Obama was president came to the fore. And all we have been confronted with for the last two years that Donald Trump has been president of the United States is the rise of what I call neo-racism. Racism like we have never really seen before. People who are now really not only comfortable with their racism, but will basically voice it in no uncertain terms. Why? Because they have a role model in the White House who basically speaks his mind in no uncertain terms about how he feels about racial differences. There's a big argument in the United States in the media and pretty much every day, political pundits, politicians are asked, do you think Donald Trump is a racist? Which is a really stupid question because Donald Trump is a racist. And he has brought into our society a whole new era of racism. And we see it, as I said, every single day. Within the last two weeks, this man who loves to tweet, I wish somebody would take his phone away from him, 
He has tweeted some of the most vile, racist things I have ever, have ever seen. And this is coming from the man who is supposed to be the leader of the free world. He has gone after four young women who serve in our US Congress, all of whom happen to be of color. One is African American, one is Latino, one is a um, Somali, a young woman who was born in Somali, who, who uh, fled to the United States, is now a US citizen. And the fourth one is a, pal a young woman who is of Palestinian origin. So they are all, all of color. And he has said the most vile things about them. Just this weekend, as we were leaving to come here to Cape Town, he tweeted about a man who has been a fighter in the civil rights movement for many, many generations, many decades anyway, in the United States. He's a congressman from the city of Baltimore, which is about 40 miles north of Washington, D.C., where we're all from. His name is Elijah Cummings. And Elijah Cummings basically has had the courage to stand up to Donald Trump and call out his racism. Well, this weekend, basically, Donald Trump tweeted about Elijah Cummings, and he also tweeted some vile, disgusting things about the city of Baltimore, which he called rat-infested, crime-infested, and a place where nobody would want to live. Now, Baltimore is a predominantly black city. So again, his racism, his venom, basically is pointed at people of color. So basically, when I reflect on racism now, I reflect on the highs that I experienced back in 2008 and what we're experiencing today, the very, very low, the depths of racism, which basically we really thought, in the words of the civil rights era, we had overcome. Thank you, Professor Leaf. I think the most important thing that uh, we are struggling with when we look at and what you have shared is how deeply our education systems, our culture entrenches uh, racism and that all of us, all of us are contaminated by it to some measure or not and how much we water it, it will grow more, and how much we work against it will obviously, uh, hopefully, we can root it out. Um, but it is not a, it's not a, it doesn't take the election of one man to change the world. So let's just hand over to Valdi, and then we'll open up the, the conversation. Good evening, everyone. Forgive me because today was a very, very difficult day. Today we marched to Palam. And the moms who lost their children in the gang violence came to that march with their children's panties, their children's jeans, their children's vests, and they hung it on the fence of Parliament. I want to start off with two very deep memories. And I want to say that I am pained that colonialism and racism has been successful in many ways. And we see that in our communities today when we look at gang violence, when we look at what neuroscience teaches us about brain development and being in survival mode and people normalizing violence. And when we begin to ask, where does this stem from? Where does this horror stem from? Our colonial past, our apartheid past. And I question whether we can talk about our post-conflict presence. I question that. So I grew up in Bromwell Street 
And um, for those Kryptonians, you would know that Bromwell Street is going through a gentrification process where they're trying to get rid of the people um, living in Bromwell Street. But I remember that my first love lived next door to me, Russell Thomas. <laughs> and I remember the hidings I used to get when my daddy used to come home because I used to run with my panty and my pajamas over to Auntie Everdeen's house. And I used to go bath with uh, Russell in that sink bath. <laughs> and one day, I wanted to go over to bath with Russell. And he was gone. He was gone. His family had moved to Mitchell's Plain because they knew group areas was going to put us out. So they moved. I've never seen Russell before, again, at least. My second uh, very personal story is when my mother had a brain hemorrhage and the ambulance did not come because she was a black woman living in a black community and her life wasn't important. And she died in front of my brother and myself. And I'll never forget that. That a life could have been saved had the ambulance arrived. They arrived two hours later. So those are my personal reflections of racism and how it impacted on our lives and in my family I am the second person to have gone to university the I was the first and the second person is my nephew who did not even go to university in South Africa he went to university in New Zealand when they relocated. Now, I can count on my fingers the number of people in my family who have matric. I can count on my fingers the number of my family who have jobs. And at the age of 11, I had lost both my parents. And I'm thankful that we could not go to any of my father's family. My mother herself was an orphan, and so we couldn't go to any of our father's family because they were all evicted from District 6. So they were in Mannenberg. None of them had place for us. Here we were, four children, and our family wanting to push us into Heatherdale home, this one wanting that child, and that one wanting that child. And a friend of my mother who said, hell no, I will take all four of them. So I grew up with a passion for the underdog. And I think that has pushed my activism throughout the year, the, the years um, that I've been working. A year or two ago, I wrote an open letter to Cyril Ramaphosa, to our president. And I said to him, you will not talk on my behalf as a cancer survivor. You will talk with me. Because strangely, where's Mandy? Mandy knows me very well, Mandy Sanger. I've become, in my old age, I'm now in my 50s, over 50. My children call me old. Um, I've become a health activist. And why? Because our elders who fought during the apartheid struggle 
It's been told by this government that they've reached their sell-by date, that they do not qualify for further medication when they are diagnosed with cancer. So, you know, we may have a very progressive constitution. We may be under the illusion that racism is gone, but it has simply taken heinous forms. And it remains invisible to many of us that we don't see what is happening in our communities, why it is happening, and we don't link it to the past. We instead argue that we should forget. So as the only graduate of, uh, of higher education, my family turned to me and asked me to complete the forms for land restitution. My family lived in Chapini Street, which is now the upmarket in Cape Town. And I say no. And they're angry. They're angry at why. Now I say to them, who must get that house? Who's going to get that house of our huge family when so many of you are homeless? when so many of you are still living in those homes which you were evicted from in District 6 and came into Mannenberg, you're still living there, and still living in overcrowded homes. What squabble will we have as a family when we get that house? And so for me, racism runs so deep I see it in its invisible form in our communities. And I see how racism has now become a battle between the various racial groups. We expected a black on white racism. I can tell you now from our experience at Trauma Center, we are seeing black African black colored racism. We are seeing how the gangsters were paid in the Mitchell's Plain community to assassinate black Africans in the Sequalo camp. I am bothered. I feel as if I'm back in the 60s and 70s. Thank you, Valdi, for that very powerful uh, testimony. <clears throat> and it is a testimony that speaks to how societies is organized and has been organized for generations. Um, in the US, we could go back to slavery, I'm sure. To South Africa, we go back to slavery, we go back to colonialism, we're going back to indigenous people. Also, of course, the debate in the US around indigenous people. Um, and then also, uh, I think it's important that we actually do look at going forward. What does racism look in the neo-colonial period? It's taken on a new form, a much more sophisticated form, but it is there to maintain a cultural chauvinism to maintain a superiority. But we want to open up now. Please keep your contributions as short as possible. If you have a question, ask a question. If you want to share a, an experience, please do so. Uh, we have a roving mic um, going up. So I'll take three hands at a time. If there are people that would like to uh, uh, contribute, if you could just put up your hand. Just say your name, who you are, um, and then uh, please share. Thank you. So we'll take three. If you want to ask a question either to <laughs> Professor Lee or to, to Valdi, then please do so. Thank you to both the speakers. That was very enlightening. My question is around 
memory and, and history. And particularly as somebody who was born in 1991, you know, having lived in this new South Africa, new rainbow nation, one of the things that I've struggled with as a black woman is conveying the effects of, you know, apartheid and the effects that's had on my family and as a young black person living in South Africa today. So I think my main question is, how do we remember so that people understand what the impact of apartheid and colonialism is? Because oftentimes when I engage on Twitter, when I read the news, I see that that nuance is missing. And I think for me, what would be interesting to hear from, from the professor is in the US, you have Black History Month. Has that in any way positively impacted how people remember and think about slavery and Jim Crow? Thanks. Um, just to make it, maybe make an addition, while these are our special guests, um, as an educationist, I feel compelled to say that all of us can answer these questions. <laughs> because the knowledge is within all of us and our experiences. But of course, we will give um, our panelists uh, a chance to answer to them as well. So please feel free, free, free to also address these questions as they come up. Okay. I'm going to take three questions and then we'll go. Okay, another one? You're making note, hey? Second question. Hi, um, maybe it's a question and a comment, but I think they are, uh, sorry, the name's Mandy Thang. I'm from the District 6 Museum. Oh, were you the friend that Valdi was the old buddy talking Valdi. about? <laughs> yeah, we come from the same ideological <laughs> space. <laughs> um, I think uh, the, what's very similar to the USA um, and South Africa, in, both in the past and in the present, is the extent to which race becomes a distraction from the real sort of exploitation that's happening beneath it. And I think a lot of what Valdi says kind of uh, brings it out in a sense that um, uh, from the outside, I've been looking at a lot of the YouTube videos about the, the sort of racist in your White House. And the thing as an outsider um, to the United States, um, we less inclined to be stuck in the bubbles uh, that people are in the United States. So we get to see, you know, I, I kind of get to see the racist response. But what shocked me is the number of Latinos, the number of Jewish people, who experienced the Holocaust, the number of African Americans who support Donald Trump in his comment about Baltimore being rat infested. Um, now that doesn't just, I'm not using it to say he's therefore justified. Uh, we see a similar trend in South Africa where the new elite, the new black middle class, when they talk about, and some of them, I include some of my friends' children who have been for the last sort of um, uh, generation, they've been in, in former white schools, so they've assimilated into these white schools. They won't be seen dead in Mannenberg. They've got all kinds of positions on racism, but they won't be seen dead in working class communities. They look at those communities and they say, they're rat infested, they're gangster ridden. Um, so I think the, uh, the, 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 the question is, how do you see the way in which race distracts us from dealing with the very real issue of exploitation and how class really is the way in which uh, the fault lines in our society. Uh, so it's not black, be African, uh, so-called African people fighting against colored people. It's working class people fighting over the scarce resources. And the middle class black people are enjoying the new South Africa in the same way that white South Africans are enjoying the new South Africa, almost in the same way. Okay, so thank you. Man. Thank you for that, Mandy. I think an important um, addition to the conversation, but also how do we deal with complexity around racism, right? Um, can we have another question before we give to the panel to respond? 
Thank you, Fatima Noel okay. Daniels um, from Cornerstone. Um, one of the things that I've been grappling with all my life, and I thought I'd share it here because I think it's something that's common between the American experience, the United States experience, and in South Africa, is the notion of the way officialdom um, emphasizes uh, one's racial identity. So as much as you like, reject race, the concept of race as being a, co a construct, a human contract, a false contract, um, and you fight for non-racialism, there's always a form that you have to complete. And this form will always ask you to say what you are in terms of your race. And, and if there isn't a category for you, you know, there's, there's, never, there's never a human category. We can't say you from the human race. You know, you, you end up being other because if you don't find any one of those that fit who you are. Now in South Africa, we thought that in the new dispensation it will change, but it actually got worse. Because now we talk about black African and we talk about black colored and sort of tags and labels that, that we never ever supported and you have to define yourself accordingly. And when I traveled to the state, I found that exactly the same thing was happening there. I mean, in fact, you know, you, the one word that kept on jumping off the page was Caucasian, and these people just love calling themselves Caucasian, you know. <laughs> so, so that really, really freaked me out. But I was going to share an experience. I had my DNA tested, and when I had my DNA tested, there was a question on the race. What race do you identify as? And I thought, but I'm here to find out what race <laughs> I am. Why am I having to answer that? So I didn't answer it. And I regretted it afterward because when the results came out, they reported that so many white people, or people identified as white, a, a large percentage of them were actually koi, uh. of koi descent. And that so many people who identified themselves as black or colored didn't have any koi blood in them, you know? Um, and of course, I ended up being of koi descent that I'm very proud of, but I ended up being an other in the other category because I didn't tick the box that I maybe should have. So I'm confused. And maybe you can help me. Thank you, Noel. Um, we're going to hand over to the uh, panelists to respond. So I want to go back to the very first question about, about memory and, and history. Um, you know, there's that old saying that those, those who do not understand history are doomed to repeat it. In the United States, people's sense of history is very, very limited. Um, and what I find is very interesting is that we collectively have forgotten about the struggles of the 1960s, as you mentioned. Um, there are many school systems in the United States where when they, when they teach history, they do not teach the history of the 1960s and the civil rights movement. And the rationale for doing that is that it puts the United States in a very, very bad light because we were, we were denying people rights and those kinds of things. So it really doesn't look good to talk about the civil rights movement. So we have students who basically have no notion of what happened in the 1960s. But you mentioned Black History Month and I, I chuckled when you said that. Most black people in the United States have a love-hate relationship with Black History Month. First of all, it's in February, the shortest month of the year. <laughs> Secondly, I've traveled the country talking with black kids in schools, elementary schools and secondary schools. And they tell me, we really do not look forward to Black History Month. Be and I said, well, why don't you like Black History Month? He says, because during February, our teachers put up on the walls pi all these pictures of dead, dead black people. You know, Martin Luther King, Booker T. Washington, you know, Sojourner Truth, they're all dead, okay? So we're looking for an entire month of, at all these dead people. And all we hear about is that black people were slaves. And maybe in music class, we may sing a few Negro spirituals. Then February 28th comes, and all this stuff comes down, and we don't talk about it anymore. 
So we have a real love-hate relationship with Black History Month. I think when we think about memory and history, Black History Month is every month. And getting people to understand that the black, that black history is, or I should say it this way, African American history is American history. And what's really important to understand is that the black experience in the United States predates that of many white Americans. We are celebrating this year the 400th anniversary of the landing of the first boatload of Africans in the Jamestown colony in Virginia, which is the first permanent English settlement in, uh, in North America. And a Dutch ship dropped off a group of Africans because they needed supplies. So they traded these Africans for supplies. That was 400 years ago, 1619. So we're celebrating the 400th anniversary of a black presence in the United States. Most white people can only trace their ancestry in the United States back to the early 20th century when their ancestors came through Ellis Island. So don't tell me that I'm not an American, because I'm more American than most all y'all, as I would say in the United States. <laughs> and I know for a fact that my family fought in, men in my family fought in every war going back to the Civil War. Every one of my, my father and every one of my uncles fought in the Second World War in a segregated army. And this is what people today, young people today don't understand, that black men left their country to go fight the Nazis in a segregated army. My father told me he caught more hell from his white counterparts in the US Army than he ever did from the Nazis. So don't tell me that I'm not an American and don't tell me that my history, the history of my people, is not valid. And what's really important is we don't get this across in terms of memory. All we do is, in February, the shortest month of the year, put up pictures of dead black people, sing Negro spirituals, and talk about slavery. I'm so glad you asked that question. Because if you say you were born in 1991, you were six years old when we had our TRC, our Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I remember a colleague of mine, June Bam, who said to me that our people who were affected by apartheid will not be ready to appear before the TRC and that only 20 years later, people will begin to share their stories. I see that happening now. I see people starting to talk about their experiences. Now, ironically, nearly 30 years after the TRC, we are still dealing with the unfinished business of the TRC. And right now, we are in discussion with the Department of Justice TRC unit. So we set up the President's Fund where a number of apartheid um, activists had placed money into this fund to help with the reparations. And part of the reparations was memorialization. So on a deeper level, on a higher level, we had put some money aside to do memorialization, but more on a national level. And that had led to the Freedom Park, the Apartheid Museum, and some of the memorials that we see here in, in Cape Town. But now we're having to deal with community reparation. And those stories that you talk about that are not written, that are not in our community libraries. So we don't know what happened in our communities. And one of the challenges we have is the way in which education was set up 94. So that life orientation became the compulsory subject and social sciences and history became 
compulsory up to grade nine, but grade 10, 11, and 12, um, it was about a choice. And so we have a generation who don't understand what happened in the past and can't identify with their parents when their parents share these stories. And we are really hoping and we're wanting to counter government's um, idea of what community reparation is. They are wanting to select certain communities only. And we are saying that can never be. Because so many of us have such deep and rich stories of the past and what they had gone through. So I think it's a very critical question to be asking us. And I feel that it's very much tied to the decolonization process and agenda. Why is it that we are now questioning uh, when we look at fees must fall, when we look at roads must fall, all of this is tied into the memory that is not there, the memory on a local level. And then we must also not forget that history can be biased. And we need to be asking ourselves, do we have a true reflection of our historical past? Is there anybody else that still would like to ask a question pertaining to just a personal story and the development of or the evolution of racist philosophy? Is one, two, and then we will wrap the session up and move on to the next. The psychosocial impact of it. Hi, my name is Nikki. I just want to say that I sort of feel guilty of what, about Valdi said about stories not being told and how the Truth and Reconciliation Commission didn't really give us time to heal through processes as being a student activist in the 80s as well. And because me personally, I don't share easily. A lot of people don't know where I come from, but I've my history from the political level. Few people here knows about it, no one knows about it, but that I don't really share about that much. And, 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 and many times I think with what's happening within our communities now, how relevant what we did as students in our apartheid era, how we organized, how we com combated the police, how we overcame things, how relevant that information is right now in organizing our own communities with gangsterism, with drugs, because as you said, our community is still in the in brainwashed with the, with, the, with the colonialism. They don't think, it's just like what happens is now. And we need to educate our communities. I live in Woodstock currently. I'm, I'm, I'm being tested now, and I think God is putting me on a level here where I feel I need to move back to Bontyable and, and, and install what I did in my student activism and do that within my community. And, and just as communities, we don't know how powerful we are. And if we educate it and educate our people in the proper manner and let them take responsibility and ownership for where they come from, where they live, they can control where they live. No gang, no drug. But if we stand together as one, like we did when we fought the apartheid government, and it's so simple, but it's about educating and sharing and being in our communities and showing these, our communities that they can overcome their problems by educating, skilling them for what they know is best for them. And not let people come in and say, oh, you need this, you need that, the army must be here. Our violence is still happening where the army is being there. We've had armies in our communities, people were being killed, it's still happening. So it's time that we, as old activists, I think, should really go back into our communities and teach our communities and say, listen, enough is enough we can combat this problem. May I ask? Um, Is the hand also here in front there? Who's got the mic? I, I have the mic. My name's Lee. Um, I've got two questions. I was wondering if you could maybe draw some distinction between the idea of prejudice and the idea of racism. If you can maybe help me 
to, to clarify those two things. And then the other thing that I want to know is if you can maybe help us talk to how the experience of racism kind of marks the body over generations, you know? So, like, like, do we carry that experience in our body? And how might that manifest in our mental attitudes to, to the world and to ourselves? Okay, and the last question is in front here. Oh, um, just very, very quickly. Um, my sorry, name's... no, there was, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, okay, that's fine. The, no. There was a hand up in front yeah, here. Quite... But we will give you a chance, no worries. It's just the end was up in front and for. No, Ngozi, my name is Ngomagazi Nugwana. Um, my question really is to the professor and maybe the American students, if they could speak on the subversive behavior that emerged, even with the hip hop culture and the use of the, use of the N word and the gang and mob mentality it creates as a metaphor of tribalism and exclusion and this uh, nouveau black um, that doesn't want to address double consciousness or even black consciousness um, sorry i can't i can't hear can you just and the nouveau black that doesn't want to address black consciousness double consciousness or black consciousness and rather finger point at who's dropping the ball when we talk about fighting racism because I feel there is something that we're not allowed and is not allowed to emerge, which is African wisdom. And as you speak of your ancestors up to 400 years ago, um, that was not lightweight, what they did and what they managed to do and who they managed to become. That is really the strength of the black man, I mean, in its, in its purest form, and something then we don't celebrate and we celebrate dead people. But on this side of the world, people love celebrating dead people. <laughs> Everyone speaks about their ancestors. And <laughs> so it's all those things that then say in this 21st century, uh, post the subversive nature of we are black and we're hip hop, we're all these things. And we, we are in this group. The Hispanics are there, the Caucasians are there. And then Dr. Dre sells hip hop to Eminem. And, just really, where are we going to end up in the contemporaneous of it all? That. Okay, that's a heavy question. Um, I also don't want uh, I also don't want uh, Mandy's point to get lost, or neither Noel's point, um, where I think the notion of divide and rule has been a very simple one always, um, and it is still very much alive and well. In how do you divide and rule people? for the purpose purely and solely, maybe in a simplistic way, maybe I'm um, simplifying it, to, uh, to oppress and to exploit, really. And even to divide and rule in a way where you use their cultures to express and exploit, oppress and exploit. So that we understand that while we're talking about the US and South Africa, this is a global problem. Right, and it, we can see it with the migrants, we can see it with attitudes towards the Middle East and so on. So there is a chauvinism of a special type of who is the best, um, who's the best on the block, you know, and whose culture is superior and which way of life is what we should all aspiring to and how do we get you to work your butt off so that you can almost live your life like us, but not quite. So um, let's keep those things. We're not going to have all the answers, but I hand over um, to Professor Lee and to Valdi again to give some response to the questions asked. That was one deep question. Um, and there's a lot to unpack in it. Um, but I'll start with the back end of it. And you talk, when I talked about 400, a 400 year experience and sort of to bring it back to memory and history and, and how do we not forget these things in black history. Um, one of the things that I think it's really important in ensuring that young people, young black people, 
in the United States really develop a sense of pride, a sense of strong self-efficacy and self-concept is to understand that in the slavery experience, in what we call the Middle Passage, which was that voyage of Africans from here in the continent to North America, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Africans died. They died in the holds of those slave ships. Many of them went stir crazy and jumped overboard. And the Atlantic Ocean between here and North America is littered with the bones of probably millions of Africans who didn't survive. The message that black people in the United States have to understand is that you are the descendants of the survivors of that trip. And you are the survivors of the cruelest form of slavery that was ever instituted on any group of people. That's the history that we do not pass from generation to generation. Now, the hip hop question. Um, hip hop basically grew out of the urban black experience in the United States of young black people who were hostile, who basically had a history of hostility, of being oppressed, put down, et cetera, et cetera. One of the ways to channel the anger that comes from the racism and oppression is to basically swing your body and basically to put lyrics, to, to put into words and into those lyrics, those hip hop lyrics, those rap lyrics, the anger that you are feeling. So yes, you do hear the N word. Yes, you do hear what we call in the United States the F bomb a lot. And a lot of rap music is very, very raw. But to really understand that this is the expression of some angry young people who basically are, have found a very, very creative outlet to basically channel that anger. Now I'm an old man sitting up here talking about this. I'm gonna put my students on the spot. Are there any of you who are a little bit on the young side and probably a bit more understand hip hop, anything you wanna to add to what I said? You gotta have my back now because I brought you to South Africa. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so um, I just wanna say like, Yes, to everything that uh, Dr. Lee said, that hip hop was, is a form of expression. Um, a lot, I would go as far to say like a lot of the 90s hip hop from back in the day, <laughs> like NWA, um, I don't know if I can say the N word on here, so I'm not. Mm. So N word with attitude, um, KRS hyphen one, like those are a couple that I know off the top of my head right now, and they, rapped about um, what was going on in black neighborhoods, in the black community, the black experience. And it wasn't as something to say like, oh, F white people, F everybody else, we're the best, whatever, you know, woe is me. It was, they were rapping about real things and people were listening. Like Dr. Lee was saying, it was a form of expression. It was creativity and it was better than going on going out and having um, uh, the horizontal violence, thank you. <laughs> horizontal violence where, you know, your uh, black people are, are fighting each other. You know, you're fighting your own people. So through, the, through music, through the arts, we were able to, I say we, hip hop was just that outlet that everyone could listen to. And if you really, you can YouTube like, you know, NWA KRS dash one, you know, look up 90s hip hop. And if you really listen to the lyrics or print out the lyrics, you will see that they, that these people are speaking on police um, brutality. They're speaking on um, food deserts in their community. They're speaking on so many things that was not being um, said, and if it was said, people weren't really hearing it in a formal setting such as this. 
So I think. That's <laughs> I think very similarly, we are seeing the very same amongst our youth when we listen to their rap. Um, it's their way of expressing their dissatisfaction of what is happening in communities. And um, I spoke to one of them and they said, no, we're not being political. This is not being political. But when you talk about your um, experiences and your hardships and what you have and what you don't have, then um, the political becomes personal. And that is what we are seeing how our youth are beginning to articulate their frustrations with government, with uh, faith-based organizations, with business, with capitalism, with unemployment, and with the, with the gang violence. We see that in their song, and it's, it's an underground world. Unless you get to have a youngster in your home, you ain't going to hear this music, but it's there, and it's thriving um, in, our, in our communities. And I, I think that um, the older generation doesn't always understand the activism of youth today. And we really need to, to get with the program. Because I think that our youth in um, South Africa and, and particularly in Cape Town are speaking out and they're speaking out through song and they're speaking out through dance. But I don't think we always recognize that as activism and we need to be doing that. <clears throat> okay, we want to move on to the second set of um, questions that we want to ask. Um, having spoken about these personal experiences, obviously it impacts on us and over generations. It impacts on us emotionally, psychologically, and I think importantly, it impacts on the spirit of people spiritually um, and over generation, and therefore it shapes the way people see themselves, um, how they see others, and how they live in this world. And I think uh, for me personally, I have been involved with quite a lot of youth programs, um, also um, on the continent. And one of the things that comes out time and time again is what has racism done, or what it still does, to the self-esteem of a people, to the spirit of a people, when you are continuously put in a place where you're not quite human. You're not quite there. You know, maybe if you change your hair, or maybe if you speak differently, or maybe if you dress differently, um, you might get there, but you never quite make it because the goalposts change all the time. And the other thing is that you are so disconnected, you are alienated, you have no sense of where you actually come from. That uh, leaves a vacuum which is filled up with all kind of sometimes, um, I almost want to say it, um, little bits of um, cosmic rubbish, you know? Because you don't quite know where you are and who you are and how you need to put it together. And then they tell no these other because they can't put it together. Because you are disconnected, you don't know where it, where it all fits together. But I think um, presently we have, in this time, a great search all over for people to really connect in a deep way to where they come from. And I think technology helps. Technology helps a lot um, with alternative media and so on. But so we want um, our speakers to speak to the impact of racism and the construct of racism on uh, the human being, the human experience, and what is it that we can do in our communities um, and together and in our universities uh, to counter, um, to have interventions where people can um, develop and can reconnect to their own sense of humanity? Okay. Um, it's in our neo-racist society in the United States, it's been really interesting to watch how racism has impacted people. 
Um, I'm going to give two stories which um, my students are all familiar with, and certainly they've, they've created a lot of, um, contra not controversy, but a lot of discussion in the United States. Um, the first story is the story of Barbecue Becky. Um, my students are all laughing. Um, Barbecue Becky. This happened in Oakland, California, out on the west coast of the United States. There was this woman named Becky. She was a, a white woman, probably about in her late 20s. She went to the park one day, a public park, um, and she saw a group of black men barbecuing. Okay, they had come out for the afternoon to barbecue, and they were basically lighting their fire in a barbecue pit in the park. Becky freaked out. Becky could not believe that these men were barbecuing. She called the police on them because she was afraid that these men were basically putting everybody in danger because they were barbecuing in the park, in a barbecue grill, okay? She was basically scared to death that these men were gonna burn down the park, okay? So she called the police. The police couldn't believe it. Ma'am, they're, they're, they're barbecuing in the barbecue pit. Yes, but they're gonna burn the park down. So we came up with this phrase, barbecuing while black, that that's a crime in the United States now. And barbecue Becky basically sees you, and if you're barbecuing and you're black, you're gonna to go to jail. The second uh, incident happened at Yale University, which is one of the most prestigious universities in the United States. There was a young black woman, she was a student at Yale, and it was exam time. So she was in the common area of her dormitory, and she was studying, and she fell asleep on a couch in the commons area. A young white student opened her door and saw her sleeping on the couch and basically called the campus security because she didn't, she said there's a strange woman, a strange black woman sleeping in our dormitory. Um, so it's like studying or sleeping while black will get you in trouble, okay? Two examples of one of the things that, and, and I'm writing about this now, I'm developing an article with a, a doctoral student of mine, um, looking at what racism tends to do to people. Racism traumatizes people. Racism is a form of trauma. And it not only traumatizes victims, but it also traumatizes those who are the perpetrators. So in the United States, if we're talking about this in terms of people of color and white people, racism traumatizes people of color, but it also traumatizes white people as well. Now, how does it traumatize white people? Well, I'm a mental health professional, so I'm gonna put this in, in diagnostic statistical manual terms, DSM-5 terms. And I've come up with a term, it's not in the DSM-5 yet, or DSM-6, but I think it should be. When we think about how racism traumatizes white people, racism creates in white people what I call negrophobia, the fear of black people, okay? And that's what we tend to see, okay? That basically, Racism traumatizes white people to the extent that they become afraid of people of color. Negrophobia, okay? We don't spend a lot of time thinking about racism traumatizing white people, but it does. We certainly know that it traumatizes people of color. And there's a whole literature about how racism traumatizes people of color but it also traumatizes white people too. Barbecue Becky was traumatized. Two black men barbecuing in the park, it traumatized her, okay? They're gonna burn the park down, okay? Yale University, this white woman was traumatized. There's a black woman sleeping in our commons area. She's gotta be up to no good. She's been traumatized. So I think it's really important that we understand that racism is a, has a negative impact not only on those who are the victims of racism, but it also has a really negative effect on those who are the perpetrators of racism as well.
I just need to apologize to Valdi. I said that she was going to be the first speaker in this round. You know, otherwise she takes me to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. <laughs> so I have to make a public apology. That's fine. Um, I'm, I'm smiling because we're going to have some brilliant conversations on the DSM-5 and whether it's applicable to African psychology. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's, that's quite a challenge, um, especially when you, when you look at Chapter 5 um, and when we look at PTSD. In the South African context, we don't talk, we're not talking about a single trauma. We're talking about complex and continuous trauma. This is very, very difficult to work with. And I don't think that the DSM-5 even accommodates that, um, that reality. But, and, and the DSM-6 won't either. <laughs> um, and, and it's quite a shame that we have um, South African psychologists on those subcommittees that are not taking into account um, the realities that we are finding. But just to come back to trauma, you know, Trauma Center for Survivors of Violence and Torture, where I work at, we work with the communities that have the highest levels of violence. And not one of those communities are white-based. They are predominantly black. Now, in those very same communities, we don't have mental health clinics. We only have a local clinic. We do not have trauma-sensitive uh, courts. We do not have trauma-sensitive police stations. We do not have trauma-sensitive schools. And in social development, we do not have trauma sensitivity. And one of our challenges that we have is that one would have expected in our higher education curriculum, when you study for a lawyer, a judge, a policeman, that you would have violence and trauma as part of the curriculum, but it's not there. Who are the clients who are most traumatized? They're coming from those communities with high levels of trauma. And our challenge is that there is no infrastructure for that is conducive for trauma counseling and trauma support. In 2014, we were told that this country needs 66,000 social workers. And in 2014, we only had about 16,000 of them. We have a country who phases out counseling. You don't get a B psych cause any longer. Now, you need to go and do your BA, then you move into your honours, and then you must wait to get into your masters to become a psychologist. But because we don't have enough supervisors, you now first need to go and do a research masters before you do the psychologist. And these are the challenges that we are having because now we have community workers who think they can get one week of training in basic trauma, in basic counseling skills, and then they see themselves as counselors. How no? The social worker studied for four years. So did the counselor. Now, how do we understand complex and continuous trauma? And so this is a challenge we're having. You have a treatment framework for rape. She comes to you today, she says she was raped. Next week she comes, she says, oh, I don't want to talk about the rape now. 
I'm going to talk about the fact that my brother was murdered. So your entire session plans, your entire plan is out of the wings. And these are the challenges we are having. And we've reached the point where we say, you can counsel till you are blue in the face. But unless you have collective processes, collaborative processes, holistic forms of recovery, we will never end the cycle. It will continue. And we are not taking into account the epigenetics, the neuroscience, the way in which our brains are developing. We are not taking into account that in the first 1,000 days of the child, if you are exposed to violence, even in the womb of your mother, you move into survival mode. We know that from uh, the research that the brain is much smaller when you are exposed to violence. Now, when we've done our People's Commission of Inquiry, we interviewed 1,891 children. And this was what they were saying. They were telling us about what was happening in their community in a very articulate manner. And their pain horrified me. And now you expect that same child who couldn't sleep last night, who ran in and hid away in the cupboard because they heard all these gunshots. You expect this child to listen in the class, to be active in the class? How no. And so we are beginning to argue that unless in South Africa we become sensitive to how trauma impacts on our whole society. Now, when we look at the child murders on social media, people blamed the parents. You're not a good mother. You're not a good father. You're a drug addict, whatever. But at the end of the day, those same parents will come to you and say, you know what? We lived during the apartheid era. We experienced racism. We're still dealing with our own trauma. We're still dealing with our absent fathers who have now come home from the bush. Now we are dealing with their aggression and that comes in, it takes the form of gender-based violence. So all we do is we demonize our communities and we don't take into consideration the structural, the systemic um, forms of violence that impacts our children. <clears throat> Thank you, Valdi. Uh, we want to open the discussion again for questions. I would want to give uh, my sister over there, who I hope if you still have a question, to uh, have an opportunity to speak. Um, I think it's very important uh, what Professor Ali um, alluded, uh, spoke about, as well as Valdi, in terms of two things. The one thing is uh, that there is almost a perception that people of color don't become traumatized. They, they're just violent people. They live like that. People even, even tell you. No, they like living like that. They live like that. It's okay. So why would you want to have all of these psychologists and counselors? You know, th th that perception. And then the other thing which I, and why I think most of us are uh, uh, Paulo Freire in, in our education approach is the fact that when you are an oppressor, you don't necessarily know you are an oppressor. You have to conscientize people, right? And therefore, lots of the time, white people might not realize actually they, they're traumatizing themselves, you know? The system is traumatizing them. How can you live in fear? And I think it has come out so much now um, when you when you've been taught that you are the superior race, 
And now all of us are sitting here, oh, happy, and we going to our little parties as students, and we're all artists, and, and, but what are these young people doing? We support to them, you know? There's going to be a backlash. And we're seeing that happening, right? In a big way that a white supremacist is, and we, but we must ask, where does it come from? What are they fearing, right? So questions open to the floor. Three questions again. We'll start with the sister over there. Ah, it's on. Um, so, hi, my name's June, and picking up slightly from what Noel said, and Fatima, and from Professor Lee, is one of the questions I would like to ask, is we saw in South Africa that the whole reconciliation process was what I call people asking for forgiveness without offering any apology. And for me, reconciliation and a lot of the non-racism efforts, a lot of the building a rainbow of saying there's no difference, let's not tick boxes. It seems to benefit good, and I use the inverted commas, good white people more. It benefits the, I'm not a racist white person. It makes people feel comfortable, it makes them feel included, it's all lovely and warm and fuzzy but it's doing very, very little to change the systemic natures of racism and violence. So how do we shift that, that we stop making the reconciliation, the non-racialism so white-centered and white-focused? And personally for me is we need to stop worrying about making white people feel comfortable. That's our job as white people is to go sort ourselves out. Um, and focus more on the work that needs to be done rather than on making the oppressor feel comfortable. Uh, there's a request. Um, if when you ask a question, can you just please stand up so that the camera can see your beautiful face? It can be picked up. There's a hand over there and there's a hand somewhere. Thank you. My name is Vanessa. Um, I have. Thanks very much for the for the discussion. I, I have a couple of questions. I want to ask Valdi. She made a very important um, point for me about holistic forms of recovery. And I, and I understand obviously that we not we don't have the the professionals. There's been social workers or, or, or clinical psychologists who can deal with this um, in the community. So are there other forms of community healing that we can engage in that do not necessarily take it, uh, require that we suddenly produce um, 20,000 graduates at master's level tomorrow to be able to deal with the collective trauma within our communities, which is intergenerational, having started since 1487, I like to believe. And then um, just the other thing around the negrophobia, which I find a very interesting term. Um, besides inherited trauma or PTSD, inherited PTSD, what about internalized racism and how we react? That hatred of self, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, when we look at one another and we see ourselves, um, how are we reacting and that whole horizontal, somebody said, well, black and black violence, the horizontal violence that happens. Because you experience it in the home as you're growing up, then you experience it as institutionalized racism under apartheid, both physical and structural. Then you fought against it, and it was also violence that you used to fight against it. And what does that mean? And then, then now coming back, that internalized racism, how are we going to deal with it? How are, you, are we ever going to get past it? Because we're not going to get past it, not within this economy anyway. Thank you, Vanessa. The last speaker here in front. Yeah, thank you. My question is, how are we going to take racism out of the abstract? You know, people speak about, oh, we don't like war. Um, 
you know, you can't grab racism or war or poverty by the scruff of the neck. Um, these, there are people that perpetrate these things. Um, in our institutionalized racism, um, we had um, things like um, taking people from their homes and putting them out in the flats. That was so that a certain cabal um, could have this huge embezzlement scheme happening. It wasn't, um, it wasn't racism um, that was organic. This was something that was generated. Um, everything from the population register to um, things like job reservation, a black guy couldn't be a pilot, and so on and so on. These were all um, so that certain types of people uh, could use racism um, for a certain end. Um, and on a global scale, it's still used nowadays. It's called sectarianism. Um, if the U United States wants to invade a country, they first make sure that everyone understands from the Western media perspective that, oh, it's just the Shias and the Sunnis fighting with each other. Oh, okay, that's all right then. Um, so racism isn't an abstract. People do it. So um, do you think that it's possibly useful when people look at racism and acts of racism and say, and, and, and they can interrogate it and say, well, why are we being, why are we being pushed to hate this um, class of people or um, that color of people, for example? Is it perhaps because there is a, a intention behind this? How, how useful is it so that we, we, know, we know that people, for example, um, on, the, on the Cape Flats, um, they are inured to violence they are kept in their homes by gangs. Remember, all these drugs came in during the apartheid era. They were, uh, our, our townships were flooded with mandrax. Uh, mandrax is a drug which basically leaves you drooling um, and addicted, so people need the drug and need the drug like crack and tick and that sort of thing. So people were pushed from le the roomier homes or the um, close-knit communities, they were pushed out into the flats to places where um, there was essentially a curfew because gangs kept the curfew. Gangs made sure that if you're out in the street, you'd be killed. People pulled their children in front of the television where they learned that they, the children know that now they must have new um, Nikes or new Jordans and this is what's happening according to the dominant narrative. Um, this is forced upon people, it is not something where, you know, it's, it's not a sort of more uh, malignant version of prejudice. And I don't think you answered the lady's question earlier, the difference between racism and, and prejudice. Um, so do you think that perhaps we can, especially with the young, and there are, there are many things, and, and particularly in but, our... Yeah, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. But can you just close down your question, so that because we're beginning to run out of time, certainly. and I want to give them a chance, yeah. Certainly. You can just f f conclude your, your question. Yeah? Now, in conclusion, I need, I need to again ask: How can we teach our young people to think of racism in terms of something which is um, manufactured, which is fabricated? Okay, I think there were quite a number of questions, so let me start with the young lady's question uh, with regard to the TRC. Uh, the reality is that we, uh, uh, the, the, the promotion of National Unity and Reconciliation Act is highly controversial. Um, government interprets it as done because we had a TRC. We view it as significant, but inadequate. We are still dealing with the final recommendations that hasn't even been implemented yet. So it's highly problematic. Uh, the TRC had listed 13,000 victims in this entire country of over 55 million. They are now saying to us they are only 13,000 victims on the closed list. The closed list means 
that those 13,000 people would get access to reparation and compensation. The sad part of it is those 13,000 victims received 30,000 in urgent reparation. That's all they've received. So we have a huge problem because many people didn't come before the TRC. And many people are only ready now to share their stories. And now you want to tell us that the TRC is done. No, that was only one part of it. So, so that is one of the challenges we have in the way in which we understand the reconciliation um, process. And I have a huge problem with organizations and government who go out and sell the South African TRC as if it was a perfect system. It was not. There were many gaps in it. So I, I think your, your question is very relevant, and I think it's still something that we need to lobby around how do we in fact deal with this. And this ties into the question of uh, the gentleman in front here. How do we deal with institutional racism, how do we deal with, with racism in general? One of our challenges is that um, we now have a draft legislation on hate crimes, and racism will be part of the hate crimes. It is now almost five years later, and we haven't moved from the draft. And we now see how certain people, and rightfully so, because um, their, their utterances were racist, um, are taken to court. But then we have other people, like our former Premier, who hasn't been taken to court. So these are the challenges we have. Um, and I think the other question that we need to be asking ourselves is who should be dealing, who should be educating, who should be advocating against racism? Does it happen in the home or does it happen in the school? My philosophy has always been with my children and I annoyed the education authorities. My child's education is my responsibility not yours, it's my responsibility. So I think, um, you know, it's got to start at home. We've got to speak around racism in its multiple forms because it happens very subtly and then it also happens very directly. How do we actually begin to conscientize each other around that? And I think it ties into what Noel was saying about black African, black colored, you know, we still have those categories that um, haunts us um, and that we don't like using, but the system, the system in South Africa almost forces you to go back into using those, those categories. And then I think there was a, another question who, uh, who, um, that was posed over on that side that asked what is it that we should be doing um, it's a very interesting question because at the moment we are looking at an African proverb that says um, if you see things with old eyes, nothing changes. And so we are working on a series called Change the Eyes Within Which We See Reality. And so for us in trauma counseling, we are beginning to say there's another layer before we get to trauma counseling that needs to happen. And it's quite um, huge in America because you know it as psychological first aid. Um, and we call it trauma support. So we are saying that given the mental health scarcity in the country, should we not be looking at a basic level of providing trauma support in our communities so that we can react more quickly to trauma. What happens is that 
your social worker, your counsellor, your psychologist is not in that community. They in town or they in Woodstock where we are. So who's the first person to react to that trauma? It is the community workers. But the community workers do not have the capacity to deal with it. And so we are saying that in all our communities, we should begin to develop a cadre of uh, trauma support workers who are there first on the scene, who can do information sessions, who can do home visits, um, who can deal with the paralegal um, uh, 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 um, interventions, um, especially when we have to deal with protection orders and interim protection orders. So we are beginning to say, hold it, let's stop the counselling for a while. Let's just begin to focus on how do we develop institutions to become trauma sensitive. Secondly, how do we then begin to capacitate people so that they can provide psychological first aid and first response and then elevate it up to other levels. We're hoping that this is going to help us um, deal with the long waiting list, the bottlenecks that we have. You can't get into Falkenberg unless you are aggressive. Unless you hurt someone, you will not get in. Unless, of course, you are famous. Unless you are... Uh, um, that guy, what was that Indian guy, and Divani, unless you are that, then you, you won't get into, into Falkenberg, and this is part of the problem, because in our communities, we have not, uh, we, because of the shortage of mental health practitioners, there are many people who have mental health disorders in terms of the DSM-5 that have not been diagnosed. And so this is a huge, huge issue um, that we have. Currently, from a legislative point of view, your, um, your mental health disorders would be recognized as psychosocial disabilities. And the long and short of it is that South Africa doesn't even have a law on disabilities. So these are the um, systemic problems um, on a legislative pro pro, um, level. And then we come up with these national plans of action, beautifully written, but not resourced. And so those are the challenges that I think we need to firstly address. Provide the resources for the interaction and the interventions to happen, and then we'll see change. I want to go back to, to, to the question that was raised earlier about what's the difference between racism and prejudice, because I think it's a really, really fascinating question and one that um, can be unpacked many ways. But I think the most simplistic way to, to think about it is that when we think about racism, whether we're either thinking about it at a individual level or a structural level, is that racism is basically the attitudes, the beliefs, the actions, the policies that perpetuate the notion that one race is superior to another. That's racism. Prejudice is an aspect of racism. So if one race thinks that it is superior to others, the things they do that basically keep them in that position of superiority would be considered prejudice. So that's the most simplistic way to deal with it. Now, I want to go further because it becomes really interesting in the United States when we talk about this. One of the questions that always comes up is, because we, we hear this term reverse racism, that basically is black people are racist. Black people cannot be racist. There's no way black people can be racist. Black people can be prejudiced. Black people can basically um, engage in prejudicial acts but black people and people of color anywhere in the world are not in a position of racial superiority. There is a writer in the United States by the name of Robin D'Angelo who's written a book called White Fragility. And in this book, she talks about white supremacy, not the way we think about white supremacy, 
but the notion that white supremacy is this notion that historically throughout the world, white people have set themselves up as being superior to everybody else and through colonization basically took this idea throughout the world that they are the supreme race. So basically, people of color cannot be racist because they have never been in a position of supremacy. They can be prejudiced, they can be bigoted, but they cannot be uh, racist. And, um, and, and end of that, okay? The next thing that I wanted to talk about, and I know we're running out of time, is it was really interesting, your notion of internalized racism. And when we think about internalized racism, most of the literature talks about the internalized racism or how people of color internalize racism. But let's talk about how white people internalize racism because they do internalize racism. They internalize racism with this sense of superiority. They internalize racism through this notion of um, denial. They internalize racism through a sense of privilege. So basically, in, rate, white people, as I, as I said earlier, have been traumatized by racism, and they basically internalize racism the same way, in the same process as people of color do, but their internalized racism looks vastly different than that of people of color. Thank you. Um, it is now 22 minutes past seven, and I am very uh, cautious not to open up the floor again because then we're going to have another round for 20 minutes. It's going to take us beyond our time. So, <clears throat> but I think uh, we, we're ending on a good note, I think, at a good time, that the, the issues around racism obviously needs to be addressed on different levels, as has been explained. The one thing is that it has to be addressed on an educational level. We need to educate our people and ourselves um, about racism, what it is, what is the power dynamics within racism, and the powerlessness that goes within racism, the prejudice, the, the ability to be able to project the dominant narrative all the time, and that we need to follow suit. So I think it's very important. And that in that education process, I think, for organizations like the District 6 Museum and so on, that that education process, it's important that we be as inclusive in that education process as possible. That we include everybody to learn and unlearn behaviors which is um, informed by a sense of racist um, superiority or races in racial inferiority. So that's the, f the first thing. And I think, as you were saying, start at the home. But if you yourself has been raised um, to believe and your mother will tell you, no, you must listen to them. I know it happened in our families <laughs> a lot. It still happens, unfortunately, in lots of our townships. They will say, I can't go into that place because there's too many white people there. I don't feel comfortable. It happens in Cape Town all the time. Black people don't feel comfortable going to the waterfront. There's too many white people there. Why don't you feel comfortable? You know? And then, of course, white people don't feel comfortable going to, 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 to Kailicha because there's too many black people there. It's crazy, right? Very crazy. So that's the one level we have to question and we have to engage and we all have to grow in it. The other thing I think that Valdi spoke about is the issue around that we can legislate these things. We can make laws around these things. But that doesn't change what people think and how people feel, right? Um, uh, what Cispero, she died now the other day, right? Calling people monkeys on it, whatever and so on. But she was still a human being. And she was raised up in a system that made her believe that she was superior and she could call black people monkeys. And we took her to court and she had to pay and she said she was sorry. And maybe in the process she really learned something. Maybe not, I don't know. But we can understand the limitations of laws if there isn't a change of heart and a change of mind. Because then we only, we're not authentic, we pretend. 
And that is the other thing that I want to end on with, is that we cannot pretend around this thing. And in any case, as the, one of my um, friends say, I'm black, I can smell out the pretend white a mile away. <laughs> you know, we speak the language and we're all whatever. We need to be authentic in our pursuit of non-racialism. You know? And if you catch yourself othering somebody that you actually say, oops, what am I busy doing now? You know? Why am I talking about them and us in that way? So that, we, so that we ourselves can be authentic in that. And so that we can also look at how is the systems in which we live perpetuate racism? How does the systems in which we live, the economic system, patriarchy, whatever, how does it continue to subjugate people of color? All right, this is an ongoing debate. It's exciting because we're alive and it's good to be alive. The struggle continues, Aluta continua. Um, it's my job to say thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, and just before um, we close, I'm so glad we've got an extra five minutes, because I just want to do two very important things. So I don't think we should leave here tonight without acknowledging some uh, people in the audience who um, have made seminal contributions uh, to this discussion. Um, and the first person I want to acknowledge is Ryland Fisher. So Ryland Fisher is here, and those of you who don't know him, he's a scholar of, of race and racism. And he's written a book about race called Race. <laughs> so could someone please just give Rylan the mic? I just want him to, to, to share with you what his book is about so that you can all go out and buy the book if there's still any stock left. So Rylan, if you don't mind sharing with people, I'm sorry, I'm just bringing this on you, but I can't miss that opportunity. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I came here just to listen and to learn um, and to sit quietly in the back um, because the, when, I, when I started this journey of, of writing about race, um, it was based purely, um, partly on a, on a discussion that I had with a, a good friend of mine in, in the at Emory University in Atlanta uh, called Nathan McCall, who wrote uh, a New York Times bestseller called um, Makes Me Wanna Holler. And Nathan said to me that people say I'm obsessed with race, but I'm, I'm only obsessed with race and with racism because race and racism um, is obsessed with me. And so with that in mind, I kind of started this process. One of, and the book is, is, a, is, a, is a journalistic book with a kind of a bit of academic stuff thrown in. Um, and the reason I didn't want to write an academic book was because I think somebody spoke earlier about race, racism being abstract. And I felt, I mean, I've read lots of books on racism, and they've all been academic books. And I really felt that there's nothing that kind of, that, that I could give to my mother or to my auntie to read. And so I wanted a book like that. Um, and it's based on, on, a, on a series of interviews that I did with a, a whole lot of very interesting people. Um, in South Africa and in, in the United States. Um, and we kind of just explore a whole lot of the issues, some of the issues that, that, are talk, that were talked about here today. And on some of the issues, I've got a, a completely different opinion. Um, I mean, I'm sitting and I, I really, I would like to have a, a long discussion with you, Professor. 
because I, I think we, there are some things that we can agree on, but there are some things that I think we, we would probably fight about also a little bit. Um, you know, we violent people, remember? <laughs> um, but when I started of the, the journey of this book, one of the first people I interviewed said to me, you know, Ryland, do you know what you're doing? So I said, what do you mean? She said to me, you know, this journey is, is a very difficult journey, and you're probably going to be more confused at the end of it than you are now. And I'm telling you, when I, when I finished writing the book, I was in a... I was just in a daze, basically, because I was so confused. But it was a good confusion, because the topic is, it's, it's complicated. It's really, really complicated. And there's no, uh, well, there's no kind of black and white when you're dealing with racism, mm. you know? Um, and so, I've, I mean, I wrote a book a while ago already, and since then, I mean, I've, I've in fact changed my views on some of the things that I've written, because that, that is how, how the debate is, you know? Um, but yeah, um, anyway, I'm not promoting the book, but I mean, you asked me to, to say a little bit about it, and Thank that's you. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ryland. Um, a round of applause. So I think we, we want to encourage that kind of scholarship, and we want to encourage you to buy Ryland's book or to go to the library and at least take it out and read it. Um, and to add it to your own scholarship um, as a seminal piece of work to make a contribution to your thinking. The other uh, group I'd like to acknowledge, and if it was done earlier, Professor, I think we should do the same, is ask all the Cornerstone students to stand, please. Well, all the Cornerstone students stand. I'd like to celebrate the fact that the Cornerstone students have come to this event in, in relative numbers, and I really want to take my hat off to you for coming. And thank your lecturer, Valamin Kalitz, particularly, for bringing this group of students to attend the session. She actually set an assignment for them uh, around the session, and I think that's one way of getting more young people to attend these critical dialogues. So well done to you, Valamin, and well done to your students. I hope you're taking something away with you tonight, and, and congratulations for being here. I also want to acknowledge that a few, a few of our lecturers are here from our various departments from education, from business, and so on. But I particularly want to acknowledge our psychology lecturers who are here. They're all psychologists themselves, and you heard what a rare species they are. Um, so Natalie, if Natalie could just have the, the mic for one minute, because I want to correct something. Cornerstone does offer a B-Psych program, so that you, I, I think people need to know that. So we do offer, we have a limitation placed on us, by the, uh, Natalie, you'd explain. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. We do have a B-Psych equivalent um, program, and we do it at a fourth year level, so it's an honors equivalent, and it takes 18 months to complete. So you have your credits and all your academic um, work all in, in um, the first year, and then you do a 720 hour practicum thereafter. You write a board exam and you register with the Health Professions Council of South Africa. And it's a booming program. We get a lot of applicants and we can only train 20 each year. So the public universities have, are not running the program because it's too expensive to run. So I wanted that, I'm putting that on the table as the CEO of Cornerstone. So something needs to be done about making the program more widely available. And we'd like to, at Cornerstone, do more than 20 students a year and not be limited to only offering the program to 20 students, especially after what Valdi said, you know, that this is a, 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 the kind of program that needed to address the huge challenges that we face. Of course, the final grouping I need to acknowledge are these three wise people on the podium. They really, really stretched our thinking tonight, I think in ways that can just stay with us as we continue to try and address the scourge, this universal problem, which certainly, if one listens to what's happening in America right now, in the US right now particularly, and how we here in South Africa have 
supposedly moved out of that paradigm where we not necessarily in the same kind of situation as what people are in North America, yet there are so many commonalities in our experiences. So I can't thank you enough, uh, Courtney, Valdi, and Fatima, for what it is that you've done tonight in terms of enriching us, opening up our minds, and taking us yet onto another level in terms of understanding what we're facing and what it is that we may need to do about it. So good night to you all. It's the first Thursday in Cape Town. Every first Thursday, I would, uh, okay, Professor wants to talk. No, I, I, I didn't want um, everybody to leave before. We've got, uh, we want to thank you for your hospitality. So two of our students have something I'd like to present to you. We want to thank you very much for the hospitality you've shown here um, for us at the Cornerstone Institute. Hello. Um, so on behalf of the Chicago School, we would like to present a small token for our appreciation. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, I accept this on behalf of Cornerstone and the people who've done all the hard work on this program, and thank you very much for this kind gesture. It's a very symbolic uh, uh, um, indication of the partnership that we want to build, and we are building between Cornerstone and the whole network of not-for-profit universities in, in, in the United States that form a grouping called the TCS, and the Chicago School of Professional Psychology is one of the member universities of that network, and we're very excited about that partnership. So in terms of saying good night to you, I wanted to point out that it's first Thursday in Cape Town, so there's quite a lot of activity in various centers across the city where the um, art exhibitions, there's music, there's a vibe in Cape Town on the first Thursday of every month. That was part of the reason why we pulled people into the city and to link it up to the arts and the promotion of the arts in, in the city of Cape Town. So many of you I know won't be going home after this. You're still gonna be going around and visiting various spots in the city. So uh, that we'd encourage you to do. But just keep first Thursdays in mind because every first Thursday, Cornerstone convenes a critical dialogue. So I just want to point out our next critical dialogue will be the first Thursday in September, and there we're addressing the land issue. And we've got Anthea Houston and Lungusili and Zabenza. They're both four um, thought leaders in, with regard to what needs to be done around the vexing question of people gaining access to land. In uh, September, October, we, in the, on the first Thursday, we're having a session on education. Um, we're having an education round table. And in November, we're running what we call a reclaiming agency series. So please, um, we'll, if you've added your name onto our register, we'll make sure you're on the mailing list. And um, we look forward to seeing you at our next critical dialogue. Before I say good night, organizers, have I left anything out? No. Thank you to Janine and her team. Thank you to Zenat and her team. And thank you to all of you who have made uh, tonight uh, what, it, what it is. So thank you. I really appreciate it. Good night, everyone.